I'm Alan Bryant. I work for Delhi Charter Township, and if you don't know where that is, we're just on the south side of Lansing. Um, I uh, started working in wastewater in 1995 in a private industry that did metal finishing. If you know anything about wastewater and industrial wastewater, metal finishers are the worst. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, something most people don't like to think about. Wastewater. What happens when you flush the toilet? And where does it go when you take a bath or do your laundry or wash your dishes? Most people just want it to go away. And they don't stop to think about what happens uh, after they do push that lever. So I'm going to help you understand a little bit about that today. Um, uh, remember, everybody poops. And if you didn't have a municipality uh, or a septic tank at your house making it go away, you'd have to do it yourself. So um, I thought it would be uh, good to start with some history. Um, back uh, in Roman times, uh, in ancient Rome, uh, they had what they called the cloca maxima. And that is Italian, and it literally translates to great sewer. Um, uh, in this particular illustration, you see what was a public restroom. Uh, the building is obviously gone, but you see the trench there. And, and in, in the next slide we see, you can kind of see how it was devised. Uh, it was a public restroom for everybody. Men, women, kids, all at the same time. And they had, uh, the Romans were very good. Uh, they devised a, a series of aqueducts providing fresh water to the city, and they also had now the Cloca Maxima to take it all away. Well, it just ran to the River Tiber. It didn't get any treatment. It just ran to the river where, you know, it went away. And back in the day, uh, they used to say the solution to pollution um, is dilution. And I guess you could say that when there were no regulatory authorities <laughs> and there weren't as many people. But uh, in a world of 7 billion people, we have to think differently nowadays. Um, in this illustration, you can see how they just used uh, wastewater from the kitchen or some other uh, maybe rain barrel to uh, flush away uh, the material, and it went to this huge sewer out in the street and ran to the river. So this is what it might have looked like as it entered um, a downstream uh, event, as long as it's away from your house, right? And this is... Uh, uh, raw sewage flowing to a surface water, which, you know, we don't do that anymore, at least not in the United States. But after the fall of Rome, uh, that, that whole process tended to fall by the wayside. And as society tended to be a more rural area, uh, uh, towns and, and individual farms, most people just you know, had some type of on-site system, whether it be uh, just b burying it or an outhouse. Uh, you dig a pit, build your little outhouse over it, and that's what your family used for a couple years maybe, and then you'd relocate it and cover it up. But that couldn't last, obviously, as uh, the population grew and then uh, people started to uh, uh, migrate towards the coastal lines, uh, cities began to grow, but unfortunately it's almost as if they forgot what the uh, Romans had done and all the technology they had because they didn't plan, city planners did not put in any, um, uh, any kind of sewer uh, uh, transport. So people literally just threw it out the window. Uh, you probably had something like this if you lived in town. If you lived in an urban area, you had a chamber pot and sat under your bed. Most people probably just had a wooden bucket. And that's what you got to use when it was time. And the way you dispose of it was just open the window and dump it out. Now, if you lived in town, that could be an issue for the people that were outside. And um, in... Uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, if you go there, they'll tell you all kinds of stories about the uh, Middle Ages when people would shout, Gardy Lou, before they, that means, look out, here it comes. Um, and 
the problem with that was it just ran down the streets. There were open sewers, and that tended to bring um, rodents, rats, and disease. So here's a, uh, a photograph of what a, a sewer would look like, an open gutter that ran right down the middle of the street. Unfortunately, because uh, they didn't understand the link between uh, raw sewage and disease, uh, often that uh, method of disposal caused contamination of drinking water wells. And there's lots of, uh, lots of uh, documentation of cholera outbreaks where thousands of people died. In London, eventually, they, they passed a law where uh, you had to have a cesspit under your house or uh, your building if you had a commercial building. And um, that would fill up. I'm sure it didn't smell too great to know that the basement's full of sewage. Um, but once in, a, uh, once in a while, you'd have uh, the nightmen come along with their uh, wagons and containers, and they would manually shovel out the cesspit in the bottom of your building. That did not solve the contamination of the wells. Uh, this illustration shows a, a cesspit that as a, it can leach through um, the soil and get to your drinking water uh, source, as well as you know, contaminated surface water can, can uh, leach down through the ground. So these cholera, uh, cholera outbreaks were happening every few years, and each time uh, thousands of people died. I mean, you could literally walk into your neighborhood where maybe a drink, and they still didn't realize it was the well that was causing people sick, and there'd be dead people in the streets. I mean, it was that bad. It wasn't until uh, Dr. John Snow, not Game of Thrones, it's a different John Snow, uh, made the connection that uh, cholera was caused, uh, and it was a water-borne uh, disease. Not just cholera, but lots of other things that, that um, w was making people sick. In London, uh, all those gutters tended to run down to the River Thames. Um, and it was really just a huge open sewer. And you couldn't drink from it. Uh, God knows you wouldn't want to swim in it. And then finally, in 1858, uh, there was a heat wave, and the river le uh, level dropped, exposing some of the banks on the side where there was a lot of sewage sludge, and the smell was overwhelming. It was called the Great Stink, and uh, it got so bad that members of parliament refused to assemble in the parliament house because it was right on the banks of the river. And there was such an outcry that they decided that they had to do something, and uh, a civil engineer that worked there at the time was appointed to figure it out. Well, he already figured it out. He had drawn up a plan a few years earlier for an interceptor sewer, and he had gone before Parliament, and they said, no, we're not going to pay for that. Four years later, when there's a heat wave, they said, hurry up and get your sewer built. <laughs> Took them about seven years to build uh, this massive underground sewer. Now, you have to remember, in 1858, they didn't have precast pipe, they didn't have plastic pipe, they didn't have, uh, they, they did have some clay pipe, but not big enough. So they literally had to open the streets and construct uh, these huge interceptor sewers in place. And this particular shot, it, it may be hard to see, but you can see that those pipes are actually made of brick. So they build a form and use Portland cement and make the pipes out of brick. Uh, because they use Portland cement, some of those sewers are still in use today. This is a map of the interceptor sewer that uh, Joseph Bagelzat um, built. A uh, hundred miles of interceptor sewer and 13,000 miles of smaller sewers that connected to this uh, huge interceptor sewer. Now, the problem with that is it just moved the sewage away from the city. It wasn't going to a wastewater treatment plant. It was still going to the River Thames, just downstream a little bit. It, did solve the problem of the drinking water wells uh, being contaminated, so public health improved. But over time, uh, something had to be done other than that. Even, even before uh, the interceptor sewer was built, all those uh, solids that were, that were handled, um, they did 
realized that there was some beneficial nutrients in that, and some of it was land applied to farm fields, but it was very difficult to uh, handle, transport, it's very wet. Uh, and so that, that was a little bit of treatment, but not much. Eventually, uh, there were experiments that uh, started the trend towards chemical treatment. And one of the first things that was ever done was lime stabilization. So you take a big tank of sewage and you put lime in it. And that changes the pH and uh, allows some of the solids to settle out. So you've got a, a, a treated liquid, even though it's not you know, treatment what we think of today, but it was better than anything they had at that point. So chemical treatment was uh, coming along. There were lots of different recipes and versions that were being developed. And part of that, um, they discovered that if they took sewage and allowed it to trickle through sand or eventually gravel, that they could get some treatment from that. And it would be what you might think. It wasn't just a filtration process, but what happened was um, microorganisms began to grow on the sand and the gravel, and as the sewage passed over it, it uh, got some treatment, some biological treatment. And this uh, illustration shows what a modern trickling filter would look like, but it's based on those sand gravel filters that were first uh, discovered in the late 1800s. And what came out of that, uh, those microorganisms that were part of those trickling filters were adapted and, and were uh, used in what we call uh, activated sludge tanks. So they took sewage in a big tank and they pumped air to it because those microorganisms are aerobic organisms. They need air uh, to reproduce and, and chew on that um, wastewater sludge uh, without getting too technical, but it, uh, they were able to achieve complete nitrification in a couple of weeks. Well, a couple of weeks is too long. <laughs> Uh, back then, it might have been okay. We couldn't take a couple of weeks to do nitrification today. So um, activated sludge is a common uh, biological treatment process today in the United States, and particularly in Michigan. Um, what happened is um, that was a method of treatment for many years, and then we got to 1972. Um, uh, the EPA was established and the Clean Water Act was uh, established. It was part of a, uh, of a water pollution uh, permit system that was already in place, but they amended it in 1972 and it became known as the Clean Water Act. And what the Clean Water Act did was it gave the EPA the ability to um, make it illegal or unlawful to discharge any pollutant to a surface water of the United States without a permit. So today, if you are a company making widgets or a municipality with a wastewater treatment plant, you can't discharge to a river, a lake, a stream, or a water body like that without first getting a permit from the state of Michigan, Michigan uh, Department of Environmental Quality. And that permit will tell you specifically what you can discharge to your water body. And the permit is based on uh, the quality of that receiving water. So it's different for every person depending on where you're discharging. But it's going to be, um, you know, things like pH, heavy metals, um, uh, stuff like that. And that brings us to today. How do we do it today? Now, does anybody recognize this? plant. This is the Detroit water and sewage plant. Uh, somebody asked uh, the first time I went through this what their treatment volume was and I looked it up. It's 650 million gallons a day. <laughs> so that's a huge plant, one of the largest plants in the United States obviously. So what happens when you flush your toilet or pull the plug out of your bathtub? Well, the water flows by gravity from your house through your lead to the street, and then it continues to flow by gravity and a whole series of pipes that come together eventually into what we call an interceptor sewer. But it flows by gravity most of the way. And here's what a crosscut section might look like. You see here uh, not just a, a sanitary sewer from your house, but also a storm sewer that might collect from catch basins in the street to divert storm water. Uh, away to a river. Now, thing to keep in mind is that storm water that goes into a catch basin doesn't get any treatment. It flows directly to a water body. So that's why it's important never to put oil or 
any kind of uh, litter or something like that down a catch basin. Um, a lot of communities, those are combined, have combined systems. So when, if there's a high uh, wet weather event, that can influence flow to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, not necessarily a good thing, but there's efforts underway to separate uh, those communities. So the wastewater is gonna flow by gravity uh, almost all the way, but not very many communities could have a, a complete uh, gravity flow system. So what has to happen is there has to be a pump station at some point to lift it up to a higher elevation so it can flow by gravity some more. Um, these stations have to have redundancy. They can't just have one pump in there. They have to have at least two because what if the first one fails? Then you have backups in the line and it fills up somebody's basement with sewage and so you can't do that. Um, uh, pump stations and uh, collection pipes have to be maintained. So you have to have uh, specialized equipment. This is a Vactor truck, so um, a lot of communities will uh, either own uh, trucks like this or they'll uh, hire other outside contractors to do this for them, but they are really responsible for keeping these clean. Um, this is a router jet, so these guys are putting the, the uh, router down in and cleaning out the pipe, bringing all the uh, stuff that might be accumulating the pipe back to be sucked up by the Vector truck. And then we have specialized cameras, video cameras we can put down in a sewer pipe. Um, lots of very old systems out there. Um, so it's hard to tell how old the pipe is. Uh, is it, what's it made of? There might be very poor records uh, for old, old systems. And so um, a lot of times they get cracked, roots get in there. There's a lot of nutrients flowing through. So once roots get going, they take off. Um, this is a, another version of a camera that can be used for the bigger pipes and you can ins do inspections that way and know where you prioritize where you're going to have to go in and maybe replace pipe or do some uh, repair. And that's what inside of a pipe might look like as it's moving along. So all, this, uh, all these pipes eventually make it to a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and what happens then? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, what's happened at a waste what happens at a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, very rarely is it just one stage or some really small communities that might have uh, uh, a pond or or something like that. But most uh, larger communities are going to have a wastewater treatment plant that has a s series of treatment processes that you move through. And I'm going to talk about that right now. Um, they will always have primary treatment. Um, and one of the first things you do in primary treatment is you screen out the trash because you'd be surprised at what comes to a wastewater treatment plant. And that's going to be uh, candy wrappers, plastic, condoms, feminine hygiene products, everything has to, has to be taken out uh, that you can get on a, on a screen like this. And that gets collected and it goes to a, a landfill. And then the water flows onto the next tank and we have to take out the grit. Uh, grit's going to be inorganic material like sand and, and gravel, um, stuff that can be very abrasive to uh, downstream pumps and, and valves and processes. So we got to get that out of there. That also gets separated, goes to a landfill. And then we flow into what we call primary clarifier. Um, this is a big tank. Flow slows down. All the grease that people dump down their drains at home floats to the top. Stop doing that, by the way. And uh, you know, it comes from restaurants too. But all the the raw uh, sewage sludge sinks to the bottom, and that gets pumped off for uh, treatment separately. And the water continues to flow to the next atrium. That's really all for primary treatment. Didn't use any chemicals. Didn't use any magic. It was just physical, physical treatment. Uh, we screened, we filtered, and we used gravity. Um, we try to use gravity as much as possible uh, to save money. And the next uh, stage of treatment is secondary treatment. And this is a biological process. I talked a little bit about you know, the, um, the trickling filters and the aeration tanks. And um, it's tricky because when you have a wastewater treatment plant that is a living organism, you have to be careful about toxins that can come in. Uh, from somewhere out in the collection system that might kill all those organisms. So most uh, treatment plants that might have influence like that have industrial pretreatment 
uh, programs to kind of watch and make sure that nobody's dumping stuff that they shouldn't that would kill those. But this is what uh, some of the organisms might look like. So there's bacteria, there's lots of different kinds of bacteria that uh, are aerobic organisms and uh, they help us uh, nitrify uh, nitrates and take care of the ammonia part. And um, uh, as I said, they're, they're aerobic, aerobic organisms, so they require a lot of oxygen. Um, an activated sludge plant uh, will have blowers like this. Um, this particular plant has four of these blowers, but I've seen plants that have 15 or 20 of these blowers. Or it just depends on how big your process is. Um, uh, most wastewater treatment plants that use activated sludge, their biggest uh, uh, cost is in running of these blowers. These blowers have to run 24-7. Um, if they go down, uh, you might have a couple of hours to save the, the microorganisms before they start dying, but you really gotta, gotta make sure those keep running. And so wastewater treatment plants always have generators on standby. So that's what, uh, the, uh, that's the aeration tank there, and then it flows into a secondary clarifier like this. That sludge goes to the bottom and goes off to uh, uh, sludge handling. And then the last stage uh, would be disinfection because we cleaned up the water now, but it still has pathogens present. So we couldn't discharge that to a lake or stream that could make somebody sick, so you have to disinfect. Um, most plants today use a, a strong bleach solution, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, they used to, a lot of plants used to use chlorine gas, don't use that anymore. Um, or you can do something like this. This is a uh, UV disinfection. So the water actually passes through a tank where all these uh, UV lights are, are placed. It can be tricky because turbidity can affect the effectiveness. Um, there's a lot of maintenance in, in keeping those uh, lenses clean on the lights. So it's a, it's a trade-off. It just depends on, on what you're able to do and how well you're able to get rid of that turbidity. And then hopefully you're discharging to a surface water um, a high quality effluent that meets all your NPDES permit limits. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the solids handling that we took out on the primary clarifiers and the secondary clarifiers. So this is, these are biosolids uh, or, or sewage sludge. Um, this particular plant I'm talking about here is where I work. Uh, we uh, have, uh, we produce a grade A biosolid because uh, these digesters uh, heat the, the sludge to a temperature and hold it for a specific amount of time uh, in order to get total pathogen destruction. So all the nasty, creepy crawlies that might hurt you are dead. And then there's still a lot of um, uh, beneficial nutrients in that sludge. So we're able to um, land apply it uh, for its nutrient value, phosphorus and nitrogen, obviously. Um, our plan is to one day be able to dry that sludge and then it could be used for various uh, other uh, possibilities. It could be used as an uh, alternative fuel so source in a coal burning fire plant, a renewable source, um, or it can be sold to the general public for use on their gardens. Any questions? <laughs>